Welcome to week two of a series we started last week called A Voice in the Wilderness. And in this series, we're learning a little something from John the Baptist. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, ever since I was a kid, man, John the Baptist just seemed like an awesome, like epic character in the Bible. I mean, just a few things. First of all, John the Baptist is probably Jesus' cousin. That's a little fun fact that some people don't realize. Uh, he got to baptize Jesus. I mean, I mean, you know, that's a resume builder in my book. Uh, he's prophesied all, of, all through the prophets in the Old Testament, you know, the, those prophecies about him, that he's going to come, he's going to prepare the way for Jesus and his ministry. And I had to think that people in his day thought he was completely insane. You know, he kind of lived on the land, you know, completely off the grid and uh, wore this crazy like camel hair suit uh, with a leather belt. Uh, they said that his diet consisted of locusts and honey. You know, he's just living off the land, just surviving. He's basically the, the biblical uh, bear grills, right? He's the original man versus wild. And, and I learned this through my research, and this might blow your mind, but Archaeologists have recently found this, this painting that they believe could be an actual portrait of John the Baptist. So for the first time ever, we may get a glimpse into what he actually looked like. I'm going to share it with you. It's going to blow your mind. Check this out. <laughs> Obviously, artists in those days were a little less advanced. Um, but yeah, that's, that's John the Baptist. And last week, Parker started off the series. And I want to encourage you, if you missed last week, man, go back and, and check it out on our website. It was a powerful powerful message, but we're looking at the words in the life of, of John the Baptist, starting in Luke chapter three, verse four. And this is what Parker shared last week. So he's a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Now, uh, you know, in, in last week, Parker started off talking about how do we know if we're going to be a witness for Jesus? Like, how do we know we're being a witness for him? And he came up with three different things, and I want to share those with you. First of all, he said, a witness for Jesus hears from God, kind of like John the Baptist did. A witness for Jesus then goes wherever God tells you to go. And then, obviously, a witness for Jesus shares Jesus with people. And so this week, we're going to kind of take that a, a step further and look a few verses down the line at Luke chapter 3, verse 8. It says this. He said, prove by the way you live that you've repented of your sins and turned to God. So this is John talking to a group of people that had gathered there. He says, prove by the way you live, you've repented of your sins and turned to God. Prove it by the way you live. Last week we talked about we need to share it. And this week we're going to be talking about we need to show it. We need to show it. Like prove by the way you live. Show it to people around you. And see, I think this is where Christians can get it really wrong a lot of the times. As, as believers, a lot of times we're not that good at showing it. Like we love to say it. We love to talk the talk. But when it comes time to walk the walk, man, we miss the boat sometimes. We need to be showing people who Jesus is. Uh, we're called Christians. If you're a follower of Christ, you're a Christian. You're a Jesus follower. We're basically little representations of Jesus. You are to the people in, in your life, the people you come in contact with. And I think if we're going to be a witness for him, it has to start with us living more like Jesus, behaving more like Jesus, looking more and more like him. And I think it starts with, with one little word. And we're going to go uh, to John chapter 13. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. He says this, now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I've loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. So there's that word again, prove. So you have John the Baptist saying, you know, prove to the world that, that, that you belong to God by the way that you live. And now you have Jesus telling his disciples that the proof that we are a follower of Jesus is our love for each other. It all starts with love. And, and he's talking to his disciples here, the ones that are about to go out and share Jesus with the world. He says it starts with your love. That's how people are going to know you belong to me is by the way you love 
each other. It starts with love. So the challenge for us is, as Christians, like how well are we loving people in our life? Not just the people that look like us, but how well are we loving people towards Jesus? Jennifer and I used to live in San Antonio, and uh, we lived kind of on the far west side of town, and so we didn't really go downtown to see all the cool things unless people came into town, right? Like we'd have people come in to visit us, family or whatever, and we'd have to go do all the touristy things. We'd go downtown, go to the Riverwalk, go to the, the Alamo, and we had some, some people in town, and so we went down and did the whole thing. It was a really busy weekend. I'm, I'll never forget this. It was probably 12, 13 years ago hundreds of people around. We were going down to see the Alamo, and there on the, the corner of this street was this guy preaching. Like he was a street corner preacher. And man, he was at the top of his lungs yelling. But see, this, this preacher wasn't sharing a message about God and God's love for us and the fact that Jesus loved us so much that he laid down his life for us so that we can put our faith in him, we can have our sins forgiven, we can spend eternity with him in heaven. The message this guy was screaming at the top of his lungs is that God hates homosexuals. And it just so happened the people with us in their immediate family, they had someone who was a homosexual. And I cannot tell you in that moment I mean, I, I, I was so embarrassed that this guy was representing, you know, God and, and all of Christians to, to anyone that could hear him in a way that didn't really line up with the God that I knew. And that's an extreme example, but when you look at it, Christians all across the country can sound the same way. In fact, when, when I think about Christians, especially when you're talking about anything political or, or boycotts or anything else, like... The first word that comes to my mind isn't love. It's, it's loud. Christians can be loud about all the things that we're against. And the Bible says this and the Bible says that. And have you ever thought about this? Like if you're not a Christ follower, if, if, you don't, if you're not buying into the whole thing and you're not a Christian, why would you really care what the Bible says? Andy Stanley, who's the, the pastor at North Point Church in Atlanta, has a good line about this. He says that, that people in our culture, culture in general, they're, they're not on some kind of truth quest. They're on a happiness quest. So in other words, the, the people in your life that need Jesus, they're not roaming around searching for truth that they hope that you'll give them, right? They're, they just want better lives, and they want to be loved, and they want to be accepted, it has to start with love. Now, that's not to say that, that we don't have positions on things and, and we don't hold you know, firmly to the truth of the Bible, what we, what we believe to be in Scripture and, and the things that you know, are foundational to our faith. But it has to start with love. It's kind of that, that old adage, you know, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. We can't just preach at people. It has to start with, with loving people people. I don't know about you, but I don't always love people very well. I want to share a story with you about a girl named Brianna. This is, this is Brianna. Brianna had just a, a difficult childhood. She was raised in the foster system. She was passed around from foster home to foster home. She went through some just horrible, horrible abuse. She made some bad choices. She got involved pretty heavily with drugs and alcohol. Before she was 18, she was, had two different kids with two different dads who those kids also ended up in foster care. She had it rough. She was basically let down by every adult she had ever encountered. She was in bad shape. Eventually, at the age of 18, she aged out of the foster system. But then 
she encountered this ministry called Parent Life. Parent Life is a local ministry here in town that exists for people just like Brianna, kids that through choices they've made find themselves, you know, as young parents and with nowhere to turn. You know, Parent Life is the one that we're doing the diaper drive for, you've probably seen in the lobby and heard the announcements. But there were people at Parent Life that loved Brianna. They didn't just share truth with her. They started with a foundation of love, acceptance, meeting her needs. There's so many in that organization that touched her life. You had Amanda and Devin and Renee, they, they loved her towards Jesus. And one of them invited her to experience life. And about a year ago, right here at our Southwest campus, Brianna committed her life to Christ and she got baptized right over here. But see, Brianna was still dealing with some, some mental illness and some addictions. And she found herself homeless and completely hopeless. About the same time, my sister, Jill Heflin, who's our For the City the local missions director here at Experience Life, she was going through this class called All In Orphans. So it, it was a foster class talking about being all in for Jesus. Like, how far are you willing to go to be obedient to what God's calling you to do? Are you willing to, to go all in for him? And she had this moment with God one morning where she said out loud to him, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And that same day, she got a call from Brianna. See, Brianna ended up at a McDonald's in a bathroom on the floor with nowhere to turn, sobbing, just completely rock bottom. And out of desperation, she called Experience Life and her call got routed to Jill. So Jill headed to McDonald's. When she walked into that bathroom, she could have, start, she could have, she could have started sharing truth with Brianna, listing all the things that she thought she needed to hear. But instead, she chose to, to love Brianna. She invited her into her home to live with them. Brianna was part of our holidays. She was there with us at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Jill helped her get her GED, helped her get a job, helped her pass her driving test. We got her a car. And Joe was in the process of helping her get her kids back, which is what she wanted more than anything. She loved her. See, love's difficult. Love is sacrificial. It wasn't easy on anyone. And Jill had this moment where she was so frustrated, you know, she felt like Brianna would take one step forward and then two steps back. And she was so frustrated and she, she heard God clearly tell her, Jill, I didn't call you to save her. I called you to love her. And that's what she did with everything that she had. One month ago today, we, uh, we lost Brianna. It's been just a whirlwind these last four weeks, but Brianna's legacy 
is undeniable. The love of Jesus that shone through her life in those short few months. And all because a few ladies were willing to love her. And now at least eight to 10, we don't know the exact number, but eight to 10 of her close friends and family have committed their lives to Christ since then. And right here in this room in our Southwest campus, at her funeral, as we celebrated her life and the fact that we knew where she was for all of eternity, Tyler and Parker and Jill all got to stand right here on this stage and share about the love of Jesus to all of her friends. And that ripple effect just continues on. See, Jill was gracious enough to let me share some of the story. And uh, she sent me a quote, a, a message I want to share with you. She says, it wasn't just me. It was our whole family embracing her. It was our Eli staff wrapping around her. It was our church pouring into her. It was Tyler, our, our group's pastor, and his family walking with her. It was parent life investing into her. That's what impacted her. That's how she came to the understanding that Christ loved her. And that is why she has left a legacy of faith, not of mental illness or addiction, but faith in Jesus. And it's her faith in him that has planted seeds for so many others, like her brother, her sons, who will have an eternity with Jesus that is secure. This is what Jesus meant when he asked Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Why did her life end? I don't have that answer and I never will, but I'm confident in the fact that her life was not an accident. Through everything that has happened, this is what remains, faith, hope and love, but the greatest of these is love. And that love was evidenced by Brianna's life. I want to share a Facebook post from her from November, right around Thanksgiving time. This is pretty typical of Brianna. If you knew anything about her, she's crazy and uh, fun. And um, this is a post that she did about Jill. And I want you to read what she wrote here. She said, man, I'm so incredibly thankful for this woman. She has brought me so much joy to my life. She's the mother I've always needed and wanted. She loves me and cares for me like no one ever had. She has truly brought hope back to my heart for people. I thank God for you every day. I love you to the moon and back, Mama. See, if we're going to bring people towards Jesus, it has to start with love. In fact, that's the big idea for today is that love prepares the way for the Lord. Love, it starts with love. Yes, there will be time for truth. <laughs> but truth in love. Love prepares the way for the Lord. And you might be here, and maybe you identify with Brianna's story. Maybe you didn't have it as rough as she did, but when you look back at your life, you can see people all along the way that loved you when you didn't deserve it. They showed you the love of Jesus. And maybe some of you today need to make the same decision that Brianna made to turn her life over to Jesus, to surrender to him. You need to experience the life-changing love of Jesus Christ, the love that drove him to lay his life down for you, to pay the penalty for your sins. And 
And when you surrender your life to him, you're a brand new creation. You're spiritually reborn. Your, your past is gone. Your sins are gone. And then when God looks at you, he doesn't see the mistakes. He doesn't see the failures. He sees perfection because of what Jesus did for you. And he calls you his, his son and his daughter. You're adopted into his family. And you can live with the hope of knowing that you'll spend eternity with him there in heaven. Today's your day to make that decision. And then as you experience his transforming love in your life, you can then share that same love with people in your life that need it. And that's my question for all of us today. Like, who is it that God has placed in your life that, that needs that kind of love? Who is it in your life that you need to be loving towards Jesus? You know, Jill says that the ultimate lesson in all this is that she learned what love really is. Love's not a feeling. Love is a choice. <laughs> and it's sacrificial. And when you love someone that way, not only does it change them, but it definitely changes you. It refines you. That's the kind of love that Jesus shows us. And that's the kind of love he asks us to show everyone else. That's the way he lived his life. You know, Jesus didn't run around condemning people. Think about that. He, he was absolute perfection. He was God and man in one. Like, like he was perfect in every way. He had every right to point out everyone's problems and flaws and point his finger at them and judge them. But what did he spend his ministry doing? He loved people. He spent time with them. He met their needs. He fed them. He healed them. He sat down and shared meals with them. He listened to them. He loved them. And not just the ones looked like him. Like he took a lot of heat for it. The Pharisees were so upset that, that he would spend so much time with sinners. But man, he, he chose to love. The, the, the true measure of any Christian is how well you love people. It's not how much you go to church. It's not how much money you give. It's not how many rules you follow. It's not all the things that you're against. <laughs> the measure of all of us as a Christ follower comes down to how well do you love people. What does that love look like? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You, you've probably read this before. It's very popular verses about love. This is what love is. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. I don't know about you, but that's challenging to me. That, my, my life doesn't look that way. I'm not always very, very good at loving people. And I want you guys to, to challenge yourself in the same way. Here in a minute, at all of our campuses, we're going to sing. And we're going to sing a song that we shared with you last week that the worship leaders wrote, just talking about this incredible love that Jesus has shown us. And now our response can only be to give our lives to him, to follow him, to go all in with him, to go where he calls us to go, to do what he asks us to do. But before we do, we're going to put that same verse up on the screen. And everywhere the word love appears, there's going to be a blank. And I want you to take some time and read it. And every time you come across a blank, put your name in that blank. So it would go like, Brandon is patient and kind. Brandon is not jealous or boastful or proud and so on. 
and really let God challenge you. And ask yourself, man, do, am I loving people this way? Who has God put in my life that I need to love in this way and love them towards Jesus? So again, I'm going to pray. After I say amen, the, the, the scripture is going to go up and take some time at all of our campuses and allow God to speak to you through what he calls true love. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you so much that you loved us and you loved us first. You loved us before we had done anything to deserve it. And we know your love for us is perfect. And there's nothing we can do to change it. God, I pray that in this moment we would just feel your love like we never have before. That it would be real and tangible. And God, I pray that love would, would change us. And that then we would love other people with that same sacrificial, transforming love. God, speak to us today. We love you so much in your name. Amen. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. For more information about our church or to watch other messages, you can go to our website at experiencelifenow.com. Let us know if we can serve you in any way, and we hope to see you real soon.